Good evening, South Philly Fellowship. Uh, again, getting to meet tonight, May 14th. Uh, one of my desires, you guys can keep in prayer, I'd like to figure out how all of us, uh, again, to begin to get together again come June. Um, we utilize the, the city's facility, and the city of Philadelphia may be extremely slow to open that facility. So just something to keep in prayer, figure out, excuse me, figure out, how for all of us to get together again come June. I think it's kind of a long time since we've last met, and I don't know, just something to definitely be praying about. If it's in a, a park under a gazebo, if it's uh, in somebody's house, or uh, whatever. I've, I have no idea, honestly, just something to begin to pray about that the Lord would open doors for us uh, to be together as a fellowship, to, to jump off into Matthew's gospel. If that doesn't happen, which I'm... Um, <laughs> Honestly, I'm banking on uh, the Lord and a mix of my own stubbornness to make that happen. Uh, but if it doesn't happen, uh, we will come June, jump back into Matthew's gospel and begin to journey and build. I've kind of just been holding out by prayer because I love uh, just the beauty and the privilege of fellowshipping one-on-one -on -one with you guys in that, in that room there on Thursday <laughs> nights. And, and as we journey, picking up and laying foundation stones and building blocks um, as a spiritual house, and and just the difference of being together and doing that. Um, so, but definitely June is a kill date for me personally. Whether we are together again, uh, or we're doing this together, uh, that's what it'll look like. We'll jump back into Matthew chapter five, which is where we're at, uh, kind of plowing through the Beatitudes again. Tonight we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter three. Um, we'll be journeying, I think, through verse. 1 all the way through uh, verse 13, and it'll be more of a devotional kind of snapshot, um, current day, current life, definitely apropos picture for all of us. Uh, so why don't you join together in prayer right now, and then we'll jump off into a uh, song of worship. Father, we do thank you for this night. Um, we thank you that we get to meet through this medium, Lord. I can't imagine uh, what it would look like. 35 years ago, God, or 40 years ago, or 25 years ago, Lord, not having uh, the level of connectivity needed to be able to do this, God, not having the technology needed, um, uh, Lord, just the, the privilege that we have with cell phones and, and uh, social media and uh, internet and all this stuff, God, that uh, can be used for good or for evil, Lord, and uh, we thank you that you're allowing us, Lord, for the next half hour or so, that this is being used for your good. Father, we thank you for all the different pop-up devotions and people's Vimeos and, and Zooms and the Snap videos, all the different stuff that's happening right now, Lord, um, for your glory, God. Just lighting up social media and uh, even believer and unbeliever alike, quoting Bible verses, looking for courage and hope. Um, in the midst of distress and a potential financial ruin or the inability to provide for their houses, God. Just, just thank you for this privilege that we do have, Lord. Uh, even though it can wear on my soul, Lord, I'm an uh, interactive person. Father, I love being with my friends physically, bodily, God. I love being with the fellowship bodily, Lord. Um, but Lord, much of the New Testament, Paul wrote, with letters that would go ahead of him, Lord. And that was how the church was fellowshipping at that point in different ways, Lord. So, again, we just thank you for this, Lord. Uh, we know that you use these things for your glory, Father. We know uh, that there isn't a moment in time, Lord, not a, uh, a twinkling of an eye that escapes your presence, Lord, that is outside of your, your glance, Lord. And, Father, we also know that in a word you could change all of these things, oh, yet man. you allow for greater glory sometimes difficulty and um, and strange things that, that are strange to us, Lord, not to you. Uh, so again, Lord, we lift this night. We pray that you would be glorified in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Your love 
reaches to the hand and you are God and I am a little and your mercy falls with the rain your power displays sing for you the mountains smell at the sound of your name the oceans roar for you and all of creation gives you praise for you are God Father, we thank you that, man, Lord, the, the things that we get to sing and worship, God, are, are true in our lives, regardless of season and time and circumstance. Lord, you're still high above the earth. The angels still sing to you, Lord. You're still all that we need. <laughs> the oceans roar for you, Lord. The mountains melt at the sound of your name, God. All of creation gives you praise, Lord. So here we are tonight. Lord, we pray that you take this small offering of our lives, God. And like you did with the fish and the loaves, with that little boy who brought his lunch. You, you blessed it and broke it and you fed the multitudes. 
with physical food, Father. Uh, we pray, Lord, even now, God, you take your word, our spiritual food, our nourish, nurturement, God, our nourishment. Father, your Holy Spirit, that living water. And Lord, you feed us, you fulfill our appetites, Lord. Just like those who ate of the baskets had their full, Lord, with the loaves and the fish. Lord, we pray by your Holy Spirit tonight, God, you give us our full. We pray in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. <clears throat> so tonight we're in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. You can kind of hold your finger there because I will quote from two other places uh, as we jump through tonight. We'll go to verse 13. Um, I'm sorry, we'll go all the way to uh, verse 15. We'll finish that little section there. Um, and then we'll, let me read through here and then we'll break it down. So Solomon would write, uh, beginning in, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain <laughs> from embracing, kind of like right now, right? A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. And then he would go on to say, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made, talking about the Lord, everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. Solomon says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which is, all, it, that which is has already been, and that what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. And so, Solomon at this point, kind of backing up from chapter 1 and 2 in Ecclesiastes, he's kind of surveying Solomon, a tremendously successful man, a man of power uh, at a young age, taking the throne as a boy, a teenager uh, in his early years. Uh, David storing up all the wealth in Israel in relationship to building the temple that he wanted to build. And God would say, uh, to David, no, you're not going to build it, but your son will build it. And so by the time Solomon takes the throne, the nation of Israel, its borders are 60,000 square miles. The wealth in Israel was, was so much at this point that silver was accounted as rocks in those days in Israel. The influence and the power and the establishment of the nation of Israel at this time was unprecedented in many ways. And so Solomon takes his throne as a young man and no doubt not a perfect young man, none of those kind of things, ends up with a ton of wives and a ton of concubine in his lifetime. Uh, but in chapter 1 and chapter 2, as you go through, 
Solomon is kind of surveying all the different things that the world has to offer and, and basically comes to the end at this picture of vanity, vanity, all is vanity. There's, there's emptiness in all of it. It provides some kind of sustenance for a certain measure of time, for a season or for a period, but eventually all of the things of this world and this life ultimately turn to nothing. They're dust, they're like a mirage in the desert when you're terribly thirsty and need something to drink, and then you grasp it with your hand, as it were, and you can't sustain or hold on to any of it. And so he goes kind of through the first parts of the book of Ecclesiastes. He's looking at all those things and, and filling up, uh, if you would, uh, you know, all the different measures of what this world can offer and, oh, to the point of overflow. And he's a perfect picture for anyone because most of us don't have the the privilege of tremendous success and influence and power and money and the ability to do anything we want to do. Uh, so he does all the research into the R&D for us. He says, no, look, I've done it. I've sat at my table eating this much. I've had this much. I've gone into my vineyards. I've had this much to drink. I've done all this stuff that most of us think if I had, if I did, if I grasped with my hand, uh, then I would be happy or then my life would be easy. And Solomon, at the end of it there, coming into chapter 3, he says, This also is vanity and grasping for the wind at the end of uh, chapter 2. So it kind of gets to that place where he's establishing the idea that in this life, all of those things, circumstances, the, the influence of relationships, the, the prosperity that the world has to offer you in relationship to money and possessions, all of those things are like trying to grab the wind with your hand. It's not going to happen. There's nothing there. The thing that you're looking for it to provide for you, it's not going to do. May may cr create a feeling for a season, may give you experiences of a lifetime that you'll never otherwise have, but will never fulfill that thing you're looking for inside. And look, it kind of jumps right into then here in chapter 3, and it, it, it fits the picture well because oftentimes we grasp and look and search in all the different seasons of life. And a part of this message tonight in relationship to times and seasons uh, and situations uh, in our lives, my Bible calls this Everything Has Its Time. And it's a great title for a study tonight. Everything Has Its Time. Because what's interesting is, uh, for me personally, you guys have heard me share and tell and you know, for a difficult season for many people, this uh, coronavirus situation, SARS-2, COVID-19, whatever uh, controversial name you want to call it, all that kind of stuff. But this this circumstance in life has, has been very difficult for many people. And for me, not so. God has blessed my life. He's guarded the territory of my life. He's provided for those in my household and, and near my household. And he's he's even made us flourish in some regards. In that capacity, on a personal level, he's given me time with my wife and kids that I don't particularly always get to have. He's caused me to reevaluate things that are that are tremendously valuable. He's he's allowed me to have through this very difficult season for some other people. And a, and a few days ago, the Lord in my life, he allowed some difficult season to come in relationship to somebody close to my life for things that really don't make sense. Um, and, I, and I won't get into details of it, but, but it's interesting because it's the, the seasons and times of life, they're not marked out or prescribed by what we tell God we're going to let happen in our lives. Things can change in a moment for us. As some of you may know, because your life over the last three months, some things maybe have changed in a moment and have become very difficult. Last year, I went through tremendous hardship physically with my body and 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 psych, my brain and uh, all my my whole body was out of whack and then the Lord allows my physical frame to be touched and all of a sudden my son almost dies he's laying on the hospital bed flatlining a week later after he touches my body and brings me out of that and I'm thinking Lord I, I'm not getting it and so it's interesting because the the seasons and times and the flow of this life so often we mark out by our own expectations and the beautiful thing is we're going to go through here and look in Ecclesiastes is Solomon finally gets to that place of, no, everything has its purpose in this life. There's a, there's a, and I'll read it there in verse one of chapter three as he opens up. 
He says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So it literally says there is an appointed occasion and a set time in our life. And it says there's an occasion for every valuable thing in our lives. Now, again, we might not think that a situation like what just took place over the last three months and what will continue to take place for the next several months, that those are valuable things. But, but the way that God sees it, because God allows it, he says, no, these are occasions for very valuable things. He's not a wasteful God. He's not a God who gets caught or, or, you know, surprised and off guard thinking, oh man, I had no idea this thing was going to happen. Let me figure out how to make use of it. And he loses a month or two in trying to figure it out. These are things that he already knows because he calls the end from the beginning. He already sees it all. And so though sometimes it really doesn't feel like that these occasions in life, these times in life are really profitable or valuable for anything. In fact, we oftentimes look at this stuff and say, how could this be of any value? This is nothing but a detriment and a heartache and a difficult season. One of my favorite quotes uh, from Billy Graham, he says that mountaintops are good for inspirations and views, but fruit grows in the valley. And so oftentimes, again, we want the upside of all these, as, as Solomon would go through here, we want the upside of all these, a time to be born, a time to pluck, a time to plant, a time to heal, a time to build, a time to laugh, a time to dance. We always want just that side of life. All the things that we esteem in our own estimation, what is valuable, what this occasion is that we esteem, this is valuable for my life. We, we, we tremble and fear the idea that no, in difficulty, and in trial, and sometimes in grave hardship, beautiful, eternal fruit can be produced. There is value. It's an occasion in which there are valuable things that can be produced in. And so Solomon starts off there in verse 1 of chapter 3. He's saying there's, a, there's an appointed time for everything. None of this is, is out of control. No, it feels like it. None of this is catching God by surprise. Though you may look around and say, God, are you, are you there? Do you hear my prayer? Do you see that I'm going to lose my house? I can't put food on the table. Lord, do you know what's going on? And what Solomon will continue to write, he says, no, there is an occasion, a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a, it's literally an occasion for every valuable thing. And so what is the occasion? What is this season we're in as you go through from verses 2 all the way through the end of verse 8 he gives all these scenarios of life he basically gives you the left and right pendulum swing of life there's a time to be born and a time to die and he then he, and he goes through all these different scenarios a time to break down i do i like that one because i'm in construction i get it a time to demo the building and a time to build a new one right there's there's all of these, this side of the spectrum and that side of the spectrum, understandings of this life. Again, we only get stuck, we, you know, we have a tendency as humans to be single track in understanding. We say, no, there's only a time to build, there's only a time to dance, there's only a time to laugh, there's only a time to prosper, there's never a time for all these difficult things. What we need to understand is on this side of heaven, both sides are always happening. Maybe in your life it's a time to build and in somebody else's life it's a time to tear down. Maybe in your life there's a, a time for birth. I know three people who have had children through this hardship. I know three other people who have lost loved ones because of the hardship. So the, the spectrum of this life, the dynamic of this age, which is only specific to this age, uh, praise God, because we're going to close out and look at that. The fact that that, that all of the downside of this life ultimately is in relationship to the sin that has come into the world. Death is part of sin. War is part of sin. Crying is inevitably a part of sin. You look at all of the things that, that happen in a negative sense that we view as negative in this world are in relationship to sin. And in the age to come, all you will have is dancing. All you will have 
is joy. All you will have is the presence of the Lord and no more sin. All you will have is embracing. All you will have is a, is a time to keep and not throw away. All you will have. And so the other part of these from chapter, in chapter 3 verses 2 um, through verse 8, is Solomon reiterates time and time again, he says, a time, a time, a time. And he gives all these scenarios of this life, a time this and a time that, a time for this and a time for that, a time for this. And it can almost come off as monotonous. And I think it's important, again, it's another point for us, it's important to kind of lay hold of in our hearts. Not only is there the spectrum of life and, and, and learning that, that through the ups and downs of all of it, the Lord is with us, right? He's in it. He's in the difficult times. You know, Yard and I were praying before we uh, were starting tonight. That's the beauty of who God is. He's with you in your sin. He's with you in your righteousness. He's with you in your deepest, darkest moments. He's with you on the mountaintop when you have both fists raised in victory to heaven because there's glory attached to what has just happened in your life. He's with you in the spectrum of all of it. His word tells us that he'll never leave us or forsake us. But Solomon kind of lays out this, a time, a time, a time, a time, a time, because that's the reality of the life that we live. So often, I think it was, uh, I forget who it was, uh, Ruth Graham said one time, um, they asked her, what's the most difficult part about marriage? And she said, it's so every day, Right? A lot of things we can duck and avoid. Marriage in our lives, it's, it's on the regular, all the time, same person, oftentimes same situations, pass one day, fail at the, the next day at the same thing you just did well at the day before. Um, but, but in our lives, all of these spectrum sides of building or tearing down, of laughing or mourning, they're monotonous. It's, this is what this life is going to look like. And Oftentimes, if, if we get to that place of accepting and understanding that life will have its, its fair share of joys and triumph and excitement, it is also going to have its fair share of mourning and difficulty and death and trial. Life is going to have its fair share of success and privilege. Listen, we live here in the United States I mean, our government has done a tremendous job infusing money into the economy. There's other countries right now. Citizens are getting no help. They're stuck. I have friends who are pastors of churches in other countries. They're getting nothing. They're getting whipped if they try to meet. They're getting tear gas and sprayed with hoses to get out of the streets. We, we have tremendous privilege here. And so there's, there's a time for, even though it might not seem like this current situation we're in is a time of success... We have tremendous fatness and privilege. If you need food, there's, there's places to go. There's soup kitchens and all kinds of stuff for us. But there's also on the other end of success, there's, for some people, there's a time of difficulty and financial burden. And the beauty is, again, that God uses all of it. And so he says a time, a time, there's a time for this and a time for that. So as we get our hearts kind of closer to the Lord and to that greater reality that on this side of heaven, this is what life is going to look like. <laughs> Rejoice. No. <laughs> the beauty is the one in whom you follow, not what this life gives to you. The beauty is in Christ. The riches are hidden in Him. The joy and the tremendous privilege is associated to the relationship with Him. It will be the thing that sustains you in your low points like the last several months and also humbles you in your high points, maybe like prior to all of this. And vice versa, if God has used this season for me to be a high point spiritually, to challenge some things in my life, to encourage my relationships as close as my wife and kids, as far as estranged relatives. But then he's also in the last few days allowed tragedy into my life difficult situation and hasn't just used it in the in the ability to for me to learn what compassion is he's challenged me michael you're praying to me now for so and so when was the last time you prayed for them 
I, I literally, I, I collapsed. I was sitting in my car and I wept. I said, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. But there's a time for all of this. Could God get my attention the way he has the last several days for one of my loved ones? If it wasn't like the way it was right now. Could he get the attention of my loved one who's going through a difficult time? If he wasn't the way he was right now. I don't know. I know in my own life story, God didn't cause sin in my life. He knew I was going to do what I was going to do. He allowed those things. And those things were tremendously difficult. But he used it for his good. I don't know if I would ever have met the Lord if it was another way. Nor can I ever find out because he used the path that I was on and brought me to himself. And so there's a time for all of that. He goes on to say in verse 9, what profit, he asks this back in chapter 2, what profit has the worker from that which he labors? Except in chapter 2, he was discouraged. Right now, he says in verse 10, I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in his time. So instead of looking down on it and seeing it as, as monotonous and mundane and purposeless, now he sees that these are God-given tasks. For us to work a job, to provide for our household, to, to steward our children well, to be a testimony to, to our co-workers or fellow students or whatever that looks like in the society that you live. He's saying, no, these are... God-given tasks with which the sons of men are to be occupied. And then he says in verse 11 that God has made everything beautiful. Notice, in its time. There are plenty of things that I've learned in Christ. That later on I look and, and I say, man, Lord, that's beautiful. Not in the midst of it. Some of you might be sitting there right now saying, yeah, Mike, you're smiling. You're always like you, bobbling and full of joy and nothing's going to change you in this life. And, you know, but you may look back at this season and say, Lord, thank you because it's beautiful and it's time. God has appointed and set aside occasions and seasons in our life for his glory. He's allowing things to take place. He may not be the author and cause of them. But he's allowing them and he's working in these things for a greater good for individuals, for, you know, for the church at large, for different countries. He's working things out. It says he also has put eternity in their hearts. And then it says, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. So the most beautiful thing in all of the seasons of life is the fact that God has placed eternity in our hearts. And, and oftentimes, for most humans, what it looks like is you go about the day, monotonous day in, a time this, a time that, a time this, a time that. And in hopes, because God has placed this eternal shaped hole in your heart for you to look up like Solomon would and say, what is this? What are we doing here? I live 70, 80 years if by strength best. What's the point of it? The point is, this greater reality, heaven, one-on-one -on -one with Jesus forever and all those who love his appearing, the saints of old, the angels, everybody worshiping around the throne. That's the point of this. This is a, a flash in time, a moment. Then is forever. And he says, the only thing is that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. It's the only thing. I love that verse because it, it, it reminds me of Isaiah chapter 55. He says, my thoughts, in verse 8, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so what Solomon is saying there and what Isaiah is reiterating is there are certain things that we just can't know. God doesn't say we can't approach Him, we can't ask Him, we can't submit our lives to the point where He has full control and He can speak to us by His Spirit. He doesn't say that. He's saying that, that, that the knowledge of what God does, the totality of all the work that He does, is past finding out. On an individual level, bang on His door. Lord, I, what do you 
what's going on in my life right now? Is there something that you want to tell me? That's That's been my prayer, like, Lord, speak, I'm listening. I, if, if, is, is there more of me you want? Not, not putting a burden on myself, laying the lash on my own back, but the single greatest relationship in my own life is Jesus. It's the only relationship I have that adds value to every other relationship in my life. It's the only relationship that I have that gives me integrity in every other scenario of my life. It's the only relationship I have that in the midst of, of crazy circumstances and weighty responsibilities brings me peace and joy and sustains my mind in the midst of craziness. It's Jesus. So in this time, sure, you may not know why coronavirus came, where it came from, where it's going, if it's going. You might not know any of those things. Those are things appointed to God and His work. You can know Him. You can know what he's saying to you this time, in this day, in this season, for this occasion of your life. Knock on his door and ask. He says in verse 12, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. We have purpose and relationship and ability to provide then we should rejoice. Whatever it is, in whatever capacity it is, it's the work of God. It's His gift to us on this side. Because on that side, once we get there, no more toil, no more sweat, no more arguing with your spouse. I say that because everybody's been locked inside for weeks now. I'm sure <laughs> we all found out how unspiritual we are. Right? No more screaming at your kids. Same reason. No more being angry at the school district because you became a teacher overnight. No more trying to play banker or IRS or manipulate and figure out how you're going to do it with your money. None of that anymore. On this side of heaven, if there's good work laid out in our life, if we have the ability to do good, then we should be thankful and rejoice, it says, because it's a gift of God. It's simple. I think sometimes we overcomplicate. We, we think that I have to be Billy Graham. I have to be Billy Sunday. I need to be, you know, pastor so-and-so that everybody in the world sees. No, sometimes the simplicity and, 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 the, and the commonness of life is a blessing. Solomon is saying that from having all the notoriety, all the success, all the wealth, all the relationships and wives and all the stuff. He's saying, no. He actually would say he envied that. He saw a man who worked all day and then sat and broke bread with his family at night. He looked in the window. He envied that. He said, that's good. It's a good thing. It's simple and wholesome. He closes out this section here. He says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can, nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which is has already been, and what it is to be has already been. And God requires or seeks an account of what is past or what is pursued. So again, for you and I, there's nothing in this age or the age to come that God doesn't know. It's all before him like a scroll. A book opened. It's like going on top of a building in the midst of a parade and seeing the parade all at one time. I love, I forget who it was, but they gave the analogy. We see it like the kid who's waiting for the float with the candy, sticking our head out, seeing one float at a time go by. That's how we view it all. He sees it all. There's nothing that he doesn't know. There's nothing that has happened that hasn't happened. The story has been told. So for us, Exhortation. I think Moses would say it best. He says, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. So in the days that we live, look, there's not, whether you find tremendous blessing or tremendous difficulty, whether you're under God's hand, uh, 
and he's, and he's raising you up in this time. Maybe you're under God's hand and he's disciplining you. I think we're all experiencing a little bit of everything there. Um, if you've had seasons of your life of financial blessing and now that's come to a halt, prayerfully you've been a good steward. But there's a time and a place, there's a season for everything in this life. I think Romans chapter 8, and I won't read all of it. Uh, I'll just read verse 28 because we hear it all the time. But it says, Paul writes, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. And so for us, look, he's not wasting any of this. He knows all of it well. There's an appointed time for all of these things. I pray that whatever God is revealing to you, like he's revealing to me in these days, when the doors open and we can go uh, running uh, without masks on and all this stuff and be back to a seemingly normal life, uh, that we don't just cast aside the things that he sowed into us during this season, uh, but we allow them to lay hold of our hearts and begin to define what our future looks like. Oswald Chambers says, and I don't have the picture of it, uh, but it's, it's one of those things that I've uh, never forgot. He says, if, uh, if God's given you a bitter cup, then let it be bitter. If he's given you a sweet cup, uh, then let it be sweet. He says, don't spend your life trying to make your bitter cup sweet or your sweet cup bitter. He said, uh, drink the cup as it is. So at that first pot for us, wherever God has you at this point, the most beautiful thing that can ever take place is a place of surrender and humility, saying, Lord, okay, now how do we move forward here? Whether that's in blessing or trial, whether that's in uh, correction or instruction, whatever it looks like, Lord, thank you. So look forward to getting together with you guys again next week. Uh, again, keep praying for... Uh, the month of June, would love to be together literally bodily uh, with each other. Um, not sure how all that works or what that looks like, but keep it in prayer. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We thank you that, uh, again, that it does accomplish the thing you send it forward to do. And um, you allow us, you bid us, you invite us, God, to partake and to, um, to be involved in this world, in the work of the gospel, in the family of the saints. What a blessing, what a privilege, God. We thank you for technology again. We pray, God, that you use it for your blessing. And uh, again, Lord, if anybody's just overtaken with uh, discouragement or uh, fear, uh, Father, or even pride, needing help and won't ask for it, uh, Lord, I just pray that you break those walls down. Holy Spirit, I ask, God, that um, you begin to make vulnerable the hearts of men and women. Um, and Lord, in these days, Father, I, I pray for greater unity in the body, um, stepping up under, bearing up under, filling in the lack of each other. Lord, the, uh, the, the true fellowship, God, the koinonia, the having all things in common with one another, Lord, I pray uh, that you do that work in these days and the days ahead, Lord. Uh, we pray in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen.